The 6.5 is on the road here at AWS reInvent 2024. It's been a very busy week. Everyone that tracks AWS knows they like to deliver a lot of innovation at every one of these events. And this is a company that's constantly building, innovating, adding services, and doing it through what I like to call, as an analyst, the fire hose. Um, it's been a great week, though. We knew AI would be in focus, but we also are seeing this big trend line of AI evolving to more practical enterprise decision-making for IT leaders and businesses. How do we get value out of AI? And that comes down to not just AI for AI's sake, but it comes down to systems. It comes down to developing, development. It comes down to making the right infrastructure choices and, of course, picking the right partners to serve implement, deploy, and build. And of course, another big part of that is, you know, everything from modernizing to how you distribute your applications, uh, you know, serverless, containers, and all that. And we're going to talk Kubernetes in this episode. Really excited to have Barry with me today. Barry leads the Kubernetes uh, business for AWS, and uh, he's here on the show. So very excited to have you here. Yeah, Barry, thanks. thanks for joining. Great um, to be here. How's the week been for you? It's been a busy week for us, uh, like you said, uh, at AWS. One of our favorite things to do is save it up for reInvent uh, and, and push a lot out the door. And for Kubernetes, it's no different. Uh, a couple of really big announcements this week, a lot of uh, interest, a lot of excitement amongst the customer base for these. Yeah, I mean, it's great. And obviously, want to have you spend a little time talking about all of the announcements from this week, Barry. Um, maybe start off just talking a little bit about the role. I mean, you know, this is an interesting part of the... IT stack right now, you yeah. know, it, the front page news is it seems like it's all Gen AI, but in the end, these apps need to run somewhere. They need to, you know, be made available. You know, you need to be able to, you know, leverage all these these opportunities to optimize your infrastructure. And that's a big part of what Kube and Kube has been built on. So talk a little bit about the role and yeah. kind of how you think about this Kubernetes environment right now. Yeah, so my team's responsible for Kubernetes across AWS. And so that obviously includes things like EKS, our, our sort of flagship Kubernetes product but it also includes customers who are running Kubernetes themselves on EC2, which is kind of how everybody got started at AWS. And I think, you know, we see it exactly like you said. It's, it's really, how can I run my workload efficiently? How can I run my workload and scale it up, scale it down, have it respond to, to the environment that it's running in? And interestingly enough, yes, Gen AI tends to get a lot of attention and, and Gen AI training, huge on Kubernetes for us. It's, it's been a, an amazing business for us uh, over the last year or so. Um, and we continue to evolve things in, in that space to meet the needs of our big training customers. Well, it's interesting you say that. So, you know, I was going to kind of ask you, you know, when you're building products for the Kubernetes ecosystem, kind of, you know, who are you building them for? Like, uh, you know, who are those that, who are the AWS customers that should be really excited about the opportunity to build with AWS and Kubernetes? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting, so from a customer perspective, it's a huge mix. Uh, you can name an industry vertical or an area, and, and it's likely we have quite a few customers on it. Within the customers, the interesting thing is we are really focused in on platform developers. Okay. These are the people who sit sort of between the core developers of the applications and those deployments into AWS, and they manage to provide the right level of services for those teams, the consistency that they need, the operational uh, back ends. So... Um, you started to kind of you started the conversation, Barry. You were talking a little bit about the uh, announcements. Yeah. Um, let's dig into that a little bit. Just Amazon EKS alone had a number of announcements. Yep. Give everybody out there, I know you, um, g give them the, uh, the background on what was announced and the biggest innovations of the week. Yeah. So obviously, I'm excited about our announcements. It's been a, a really big show for us. Uh, the first one was hybrid nodes, and and our goal here was to help customers who are down on that migration journey. They're trying to modernize their apps, but they're still on-prem. You know, if you look at Gartner numbers and things, they'll tell you a huge amount of workload is still sitting on-prem, mm. trying to find a path to the cloud. And so one of the things that Hybrid Nodes does is it allows you to take those assets that are on-prem and use them, but use them with EKS in its normal form. So you get the operational efficiency that EKS can provide, but you're still leveraging these assets. Maybe you have a seven-year amortization cycle or something like that. Burn them down. And, and you can use those over time with EKS. You can start bursting workloads into the cloud, take full advantage of all the things that AWS and EKS can provide um, while still leveraging these assets. In case of certain workloads, maybe you want it to stay on-prem, now you've got a, a mix, and, and we support that as well. So that's been super exciting, lots of, uh, of strong interest in that. Uh, probably an even bigger announcement for us, a big shift uh, as, as we've looked at the customer base and talked to them about where they are in their Kubernetes journey. Uh, Kubernetes has been around for a while. It had its 10th anniversary. And, you know, originally you had a lot of tweakers 
and, and they didn't, they liked having that control. They really kind of wanted to own and operate pieces themselves. And so there was always a constant back and forth with say the EKS team about like, how much are we going to do? Yeah. Uh, and over the last, you know, 12, 18 months, that's really shifted. And, and what we see a lot now is please do more for us. Like we don't want to do these things. We got it, it works well, but we don't have the time to manage it. We want to focus on higher level yeah. problems. So EKS auto mode was announced on Sunday afternoon. And our goal with this is we're going to really take on a lot more of the burden in the cluster. So we're going to install and manage um, different controllers that are the most common ones that customers have. We're going to take care of version lifecycle management, one-click upgrades. Um, and interestingly, we've introduced this new model with EC2. So we will actually control and spin up and manage your EC2 instances now, including patching. So if there are CVEs, you get our operational excellence to go and patch those CVEs. Yep. But at the same time, you can take full advantage of EC2 in terms of all of the capabilities around ODCRs, reserved instances, spot, all of these things you can still take advantage of. Um, but we're going to go and manage that for you and drive your efficiency up, help you scale faster up or down to save costs. Yeah, it's interesting, Barry. If you think about sort of the evolution of the whole cloud platform, uh, we're seeing so much interest in managed things, yeah. be, you know, whether that's been this, the growth of serverless, um, bedrock. I yep. mean, of course, there's always going to be those companies that really want to they, they want to play with all the levers and the knobs and piece parts. But it sounds to me like even in um, you know containers and in Kubernetes in particular, you guys are seeing an increase in demand for hey, how much can we automate? How much simpler can this get? I'm sure there will be toys for developers in queue and everything else that sure. they're going to start to to be really valuable. And I mean, part of the allure of Kubernetes is it's this giant open source project, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's you know, I know uh, AWS over the years has had a little bit of an evolution of its own multi-cloud posture. Yep. Um, I think the AI era has sort of been a forcing function that all prem and cloud providers have had to accept that we're gonna have a certain amount of workloads distributed, but Kubernetes has always been an enabler of that. And, yep. you know, I guess, I'm interested in kind of what your thoughts are on open source as a whole yeah. um, and where AWS sort of fits in in the evolution of that. Yeah, I, I, it's a great question. I mean, we've, we've, we have evolved our thinking over time, for sure. Uh, we listen to our customers. We've heard a lot from customers around um, open APIs like Kubernetes, yep. uh, the power that that gives them, the ability to, for them to feel like they're going to be able to consistently drive their own operational behaviors. And for us, a lot of times, I mean, I mentioned hybrid nodes, on-prem versus cloud. That's always been one of the big things we've heard from customers. Like, I'm running a bunch of Kubernetes on-prem. I'd like it to be similar in the cloud. And so that's kind of led us down that path. So I think for us, we see open source as um, super valuable to our customers. Um, and we also see it as a, a community that we can help participate in. So we have a saying internally, like, Kubernetes is bigger than just us. Like, if Kubernetes went away, our product goes away. Um, and if we don't contribute to the community, then it's more likely not to be successful. So we see it as, as very valuable to us to be a part of that community. We continue to contribute to it. We continue to deliver projects and donations into the CNCF um, because that's what our customers need. That's what they expect and they want. Uh, and for us to, to take what we are really good at, that's operational excellence. It's availability, scalability, security. Those are the things we are providing by managing these components on, on the behalf of our customers. Yeah, it sounds like... Uh the company, probably not even noted as much as maybe it should be, um, is really making a lot of efforts in that open space, open source community, which we is great. Have. Yeah, we, I think, you know, we, we, it's very difficult in the open source world. You can never give back as much as you get. I think that's just generally true. A, a person yeah. here at AWS kind of coined that internally. And I think it's true, but you can give back. You can make the community stronger. Uh, Carpenter's a great example. So we donated Carpenter to Scheduler in, in Kubernetes. In fact, if you look at EKS Automode under the covers, Carpenter is managing those EC2 instances. We're deciding what to, what to fire up, what to scale up, scale down. It's driven by Carpenter. We took Carpenter earlier this year and we donated it to the CNCF to put it under neutral governance to say, we think this is a great answer for the Kubernetes community, not just for AWS. And we've seen other hyperscalers pick up Carpenter. We've seen a lot of customers pick it up and deploy it themselves on-prem. And now we have EKS Automa, which allows you to go leverage Carpenter, but with our operational excellence running it in the background for you. Yeah, it's like nerd altruism. It, <laughs> that's one way to put it, yes. <laughs> um, so let's kind of wrap this with a little bit of an outlook. So, yeah. you know, we're seeing so much change in the industry, yeah. but obviously sometimes they say the more things change, the more things stay the same. Sure. A lot of the guts are still really 
built the same way. You know, how fast you can do it, whether that's, you know, Q or other tools helping you sure. build code, whether that's, you know, obviously different types of compute horsepower required for different workloads, but in the end, you still have all the same challenges for compute, just scale in a lot of ways. So, like, what do you sort of expect in terms of AWS and Kubernetes over the next year? What are the developments you're most excited about? Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, I used to always joke with people, if you want to know what's coming next, go read the IBM Red Books from 1970 something, and yeah. like it's all kind of laid out, right? Yeah. Because these abstractions have, have happened kind of repeatedly over time. Yeah, the accordion. And, yeah, exactly. You know, it's like client and... and yeah, 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 and so, but, but what we see now is where is Kubernetes in that life cycle? Where is this container ecosystem sitting at? And what we tend to see is it's this movement up the stack of management, like you were kind of alluding to earlier. How do I operationalize this more effectively? How do I do it at a much, much larger scale, right? We see people trying to do these massive Gen AI models on EKS. Training those models takes a lot of compute. It takes a lot of responsiveness. It takes a lot of really effective error handling. And these are all the areas that we're spending a bunch of time investing. And then looking at that boundary between that operating component set and the developers who are trying to deliver to it. And looking at ways that we can help that be more effective and more efficient and scale better. Well, Barry, it's going to be an exciting year ahead. It was an exciting year this year. Yeah. And um, I'm... You know, I'm very optimistic about how all this technology is really going to drive the enterprise of the future. And I'm really glad to see a little bit of the exuberance wear and a little bit of the pragmatism come to the surface. And I definitely felt that here at reInvent. So congrats on the announcements. Congrats on all that's going on. And long live open source Kubernetes. And uh, have a great uh, rest of your AWS reInvent. Thanks very much. Looking forward to next year, too. And thank you very much for tuning in and being part of the 6.5 on the road here at AWS reInvent 2024 in Las Vegas. It's been a great show. Hope you'll subscribe and tune into all of our coverage here at the event and be part of our community to watch all of the 6.5 episodes. But for this one, it's time to say goodbye. We'll see you all later.